Well, I started out in New York making my work in 1994. My first group work was in front of the United Nations. I have no idea why I chose the United Nations, but um, the police were so in shock that they diverted traffic and actually helped me. <laughs> and afterward, the sergeant asked me for prints, so a month later, I went up to the precinct and brought everyone signed prints of the work. Usually I work with museums, contemporary art galleries, and sometimes a biennial. But on occasion, I come out of that sort of insular, sacred shell of the art world and make a work that somehow goes beyond the museum walls. And this is a work I did for Paz Magazine. It was the cover of their monthly magazine, and this was the 10th anniversary issue. And Paz is a magazine that conveys information about AIDS and HIV to the community and also to the world. The owner of this uh, restaurant in the West Village is actually in the photograph. And the restaurant's name is Florent. And he even puts his uh, T cell count on the board of the restaurant. And you know that the T cell count, T cells actually protect the body from infection. So by placing it in the restaurant, definitely reminded him that he was living and living amongst his friends and living while working. When, presidents, when President Bush's czar of AIDS received this magazine in his doctor's office, he canceled his subscription. <laughs> so this is my latest work. This was in Sydney, and it was, I was commissioned by the uh, gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. And I told every, I asked every gay person to bring a token straight person. <laughs> and this was about community, about bringing the gay and straight community together in front of an iconic Sydney Opera House. This is around 5,000 people. And then I asked everyone to embrace, not only with their friends, but also as strangers, and some strangers actually even kissed. No one's ever seen this work. This work is inside the Opera House. Most people who saw my, me working in the media, because sometimes press is invited to cover my work, artworks, they didn't, press wasn't allowed inside. So this is a work that I did inside. Obviously, this is a video projection, but if you saw the work in a gallery or on a museum wall, the finished photograph, it would very, be very crisp and, and very, it would be like a gem. This is a, a new work that I did with Greenpeace. Now, Greenpeace asked me, what would I like to do in Switzerland? Would you like, can we help you get 500 people on a glacier? And I thought they were crazy, because I actually had thought of that idea, and why would anyone else think of that idea? <laughs> and since I was a kid, Greenpeace had always been sort of the, the rebel heroes, the superheroes of art activism, environment, environmental activism. They would create incredibly large banners and rappel down the buildings, bridges, uh, cooling towers of nuclear plants, and to be asked by such a uh, non-aggressive um, environmental group to make an artwork with them, I was overwhelmed. I, I said yes immediately, and we were both inside each other's head. And the head of Greenpeace actually said to me in the 70s that they had, Joseph Boys wanted to do a work with, with them. He approached them. And for some reason, they turned them down. And they said they didn't want to make that mistake again. They wanted to work with more contemporary artists to spread the word about environmental change and the melting of the European glaciers. So this work was done on Alich Glacier. We actually used 
the same material that cools, that they cover glaciers with um, now to prevent them from melting. Acres and, acre and acres of this uh, reflective white material, we actually cut it up and used it as small pads for their backs, and we used hotel slippers for their feet. So they actually walked out on hotel, white hotel slippers and then stepped on them. So those are the two ways we kept people warm. And uh, this glacier is huge. We're a little speck in there. This is from the top. And this glacier is the largest in Europe. It's in Switzerland. It's called Alich Glacier. And it's disappearing at an alarming rate. It could be gone in 100 years. It supplies most of the drinking water for Switzerland, as well as hydroelectricity. And its waters, flows, its waters flow into the rivers of France. And France is 80% nuclear. This is a recent work that I also did with Greenpeace. And this was to raise awareness about climate change and agriculture in France, which supplies most of the, of the vegetables and fruit for all of Europe. And this was sort of protecting the vineyards, using people to create sort of a, a living greenhouse. And so I'm making my work, so how does it resonate throughout the world? Well, if I don't, usually if I do not um, give the press and the art press a place to cover my installations, they'll come by helicopters, they'll be in the back of my photos, they'll drive trucks into it to cover it. So we, the museums devised a way, the contemporary museums I worked with, to give the, the press and the art press a way to view my work on the side, not to get my angle of the photograph or the videos that I make, but just something on the side so they can feel part of it and to celebrate it. And my work got more and more popular and suddenly I realized that maybe I can get away from just making works for myself and maybe I can make a work for myself and somehow the effect of it, the effect of seeing it, will change the way people think about the certain issue that I'm working within. And in this case, it was the temperatures in France were getting higher and higher, so soon the great wines of France will be the great wines of Germany. I always like to remind people in sports that the Olympics used to be naked. And so when I was, when I was uh, asked to do a work as the feature artist of the Euro Cup in Vienna, I gladly agreed. There's nothing like reminding the public that sports is not the only important thing in life, that art is, the body is, that um, without artists and designers, you wouldn't have the uniforms that you're wearing, you wouldn't have the beautiful stadiums that you play in or the symbols that you wear. And so this was a work bringing the body back into sports. So I think by bringing the body into certain situations, whether it's the city, into a stadium, it really moves issues of uh, free speech And not only can I work, still work with the body as an abstraction, I can actually send a message as well. And this is a world where there are opposites. There's naked and there's clothed. How clothed can you get? You can, uh, you can wear a burqa. You can be totally covered up. And how naked can you get? There you go. I, I personally love a world where people are more free and more open with their, the clothes they wear. And my works usually are either put as murals on the side of a building or wrapped on a, around um, a structure or, but most often they're shown in a gallery setting. That is uh, tequila, by the way. <laughs> no, it's not. And then I, I did a work in Mexico City, which was very unexpected. I never knew that 18,000 people would show up. Four days before this work, the president of the country said, no way. 
And I said, we already sent the email out. <laughs> what am I going to do? Now it's going to be a protest. So it wasn't a protest. Eventually, the office of the president said yes. Um, I had tried to ask them if they could put the flag up a half hour earlier before this work so I could have the flag in it, but the office of the president refused. So I did a, a Mexican salute, sort of saluting the flag that wasn't there. And hopefully one day I can go back to the Zocalo and possibly paint maybe 2,000 people and make a human flag so I could paint the bodies. And then, like this wasn't enough, I decided, well, look at that avenue. How many, how many, avenue down, how many avenues down can we do this work? And so I had everyone holding each other as a community, entering and extending into the city, sort of forming a giant middle finger up to conservatives. <laughs> With the hand up, sort of the power to the people. And this work was, there, you know, there were many women's issues going on at the time, and, I, and uh, the women had just won the right for abortion in the city, so before, I had been visiting the city a lot, and for me, this was sort of like, they were like sleeping either pleasantly in front of government or, you know, or the, the government was sort of pushing their spirits down. So this was sort of this yin and yang. So this, I separated the men and the women. And this is a work, again, with, the, with just the women. So the previous one was with women, and this is with women as well, in front of the federal building. I'd love to do that in front of the White House. So I was commissioned by the UN to make an exploratory work for bringing attention to the rising waters because of the melting ice caps. And these are some of the works that I aren't made that I, I propose to them. So this is in Central Park. This was going to be a floating, uh, sort of a floating island of people in front of the United Nations. And so these are all done in the computer. It's not as exciting for me. <laughs> this is a small island on the, uh, on the East River. That's across from the United Nations, and I was going to fill people up on it. So these works were never realized, unfortunately, because they told me in a meeting of very high-profile people and 30 people at the United Nations that they would have had to put it to a vote. I was like, yeah, let's put it to a vote. <laughs> but I don't think, uh, I mean, obviously there are more important issues going on. But you know, I, I do feel that uh, it would have been a great work. I would have made this piece. It would have looked just like that. Um, it, it, to make a piece like that is expensive, though. I would have, that's, that would have been $50,000 to build the metal armature and have, the, uh, and have it tested to put people on like that. But I, I was prepared to do it. And that's outside the United Nations. And this was down 7th Avenue. And I, I was prepared to get 10,000 people down 7th uh, Avenue. So if I can just move that to Washington, D.C. on the mall, I'd be pretty set with that idea. And now we're going to show a little video of some works that I made in, uh, in the botanical gardens here in San Miguel. And I hope you enjoy it. It's like three minutes long. Here you go. I hope. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Eh, justamente antes de empezar. Need your sunglasses with all your stuff? Des we are doing this event here called Peace Body Rock, which is an art in action initiative that we've taken with one of our um, speakers this year, Spencer Tunick.
right there. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. Don't move. The women are headed back down. The men can put on their clothes. Los hombres ya se pueden vestir. And then follow me to the big cactus. Yeah. Don't look at me. Back. Back. You have to put, sir, you have to let, rest your heads on the grass. Put them in the piso. Rest your heads on the grass. That guy in the middle has to relax. just finished the uh, installation Peace Body Rock and uh, it was amazing, it was magical. This is a special town and it's sort of a historical moment. Cambiar cultura es el de mejorar puntos de vista. Pienso que es una experiencia única que en la vida puedes volver a vivir. Esto es un jardín botánico, pero además de un jardín botánico es muchas cosas, ¿no? Y una de las cosas que es es un centro comunitario, es un centro de reunión comunitaria. Entonces, cualquier expresión de la comunidad en San Miguel o fuera, eh, que se quiera dar en el jardín botánico, que vaya de acuerdo con los fines de paz, de ecología, de conservación y de cultura, es bienvenida. Entonces, por esa razón, nosotros estamos encantados de que ocurra esta situación. Thank you.